Bullshit. It's the No BS Marketing Show. I'm your host, Dave Mastovich. Our guest today is Chris Miladinovich, of a f- and who's also a founding principal at Prospire. But first, let's hit the bullseye. A lot of people know about Lego. Many have played with Lego, certainly young boys. The colorful interlocking plastic bricks that can be assembled and connected to construct whatever kids imagine. Vehicles, buildings, robots... Well, Lego knew they had a problem. Boys played with Legos way more than girls did. The company did a study and then found out that only 9% of the primary users of the toy were female in the history of the company up through the early 2000s. And Lego committed to an intense marketing intel program to figure out how to increase girls' interest in Lego toys. Lego's Intel started out by sending out researchers to do a four-year study involving 3,500 girls and their mothers. And Chris will talk about how his company does studies of this nature more on a B2B side, but still it's the same type of market research, marketing Intel that we talk about so much on this show. Lego had 3,500 girls and their mothers that they were doing a four-year study. Now, that's intense. This market research included studying the girls' playing habits and extensive questioning regarding what would make Legos more interesting for girls. The marketing intel indicated boys build in a linear fashion following what's on the box. Girls prefer a more personal approach, creating their own story, their own story-filled environments, actually, and even imagining themselves living inside those environments. Lego listened and came out with a new line of toys called Friends. The bricks were changed to more vibrant colors. The packaging also changed, as did the figurines, which were made bigger to accommodate accessories such as hairbrushes and purses in their grips. All of these changes were in line with what the market research data found to be more appealing. Lego's CEO said, our methods are simple. Meet children's needs by testing prototypes on them and getting their opinion. We realized girls like building too, so Lego gave them the chance to customize their world. Until then, their needs were not met. We also realized girls wanted to be able to identify with the figures, and we therefore had to develop figures closer to their expectations. Since friendship is a core value for girls, we created a universe which centered around a story of friendship between our five heroines. Do the necessary marketing intel. Invest in it. Watch Listen to and learn from your customers. Tweak your product or service accordingly. Build your story around the changes. Then tell your target audiences about it. Now that's how you hit the bullseye. The No BS Show is brought to you by Audible.com. Get a free audiobook download and 30-day free trial at audibletrial.com slash no BS. Again, that's audibletrial.com slash no BS for your free audiobook. Over 180,000 titles to choose from for your iPhone, Android, Kindle, or MP3 player. Our guest today is Chris Militinovich, a founding principal and VP of consulting at Prospire, responsible for firm operations and client service delivery of business and technology professional services. He's also treasurer for Condor Aero Club, Inc., responsible for the financial strategy and operations of the region's largest flying club of 130 members, and he's a flight instructor. Chris has over 16 years of professional consulting experience leading large-scale, complex business transformation programs. He's a strategic thinker with strong process and technological skills and a unique ability to solve problems with uncommon solutions to obstacles and opportunities. He's passionate about making organizations better than the way he found them. And he has a mini pig named Nola. All that stuff's true. And he's going to talk about all of it. The pilot license, the pilot instructor, the mini pig Nola, his business prospire, his background. Chris, how you doing? Good, Dave. Thanks for having me on the show again. I uh, I love working with you. Well, a real quick recap, because I do want to make sure that both episodes have the chance to hear about your 
a mini pig in the event with the Boys and Girls Clubs. So you grow up in Norin High School, go to Duquesne University, have a double dual major, marketing and information systems. You come out of Duquesne and you get a highly coveted position with Deloitte Consulting. You're there seven years. You get a chance to use Deloitte University. You get some baptism by fire on the job training, but you also have the training that they provide through Deloitte University. You end up getting the PMP status, which I want you to touch on, all paid for by Deloitte. You then end up taking a brief stint with UPMC where you were strong enough to admit that you weren't a fit and you quickly found a way to leave that. You went to a local Pittsburgh management consulting firm for three and a half years. While there, you were in an uncomfortable position. In episode one, you talked about it when you said it was the answer to both of our questions. One of our questions is, when did you see BS in the workplace and when were you the BSer? You coalesced it all into one and said it happened at both places. The company had BS going on. They were putting you in a position where you had to overpromise and underdeliver. That's when you were the BSer. After a, a short period of you being the BSer and saying, I'm overpromising and underdelivering and having to lead this team, you said, I've got to change and I'm going to change by starting my own company and living my dream. So for six months, you planned your company Prospire and you've now seen it grow for a little while. And you said in the last episode, it is going well and that you got through that first six months to a year when people doubted you, and now you're busier than busy. So from that quick, brief bio, what do you want to talk about in part two of this uh, No BS show? Well, I'd I'd love to love to expand on uh, all the opportunities in the marketplace for taking our ideas and and our visions and beliefs, uh, and and going out and doing that no BS, that straight talk. That that's what we believe in, um, because that leads to uh, trusted, valuable relationships. And I just was talking to one of my clients about, you know, I said, why do you buy from me? And um, and she. She went down the path of, well, you're my friend, you, you know, you know, you're my friend. We, we, we help each other out. But, uh, and I said, oh, yeah, I know, I know we're friends and, and you'll do, you'll do me favors. I'll do you favors, blah, 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 blah. But what you really buy from me for a real reason. What is that? And that reason is because she trusts me. She trusts me through uh, demonstrated performance. Um, you don't just hang a shingle and people just start calling you. People call you because you're a trusted advisor, you trusted demonstrated performance. And I think two of the qualities that lead to that trusted advisor status are that building relationships and that no BS, which you, which you've coined. Uh, but, uh, in, in my, in my world, I call that straight talk. So love to, love to expand upon that if, uh, that's what you're interested in. Absolutely. One of the things that happened to me, Chris, was, uh, Simon Sinek's book, Start With Why, had a big impact on me. As I'm reading that as a CEO, I thought, I totally relate to how he says you have to know your why, your reason for being. But I believe that for, my company and the companies we work with, they have to know their second why, their customer's why or reason for buying, because that's the only way you're going to be able to build your message, tell your story, do your marketing, and make a positive impact. So it's about answering the two why questions, our why or reason for being, and our customer's why, their reason for buying, and then crystallizing that into one big idea, one memorable message or theme that makes an emotional impact on our target audiences. And you touched on some stuff in the first episode that we can talk a little bit more about if this is where you want to go with it. But whether it's for you personally or your company, what's the big idea? I think the big idea is to build a... And the big idea is for my company, okay? Uh, Our company. And our big idea is to build a company, and, and this is no BS, that is built on... Um, trust and relationships. Uh, I've made a lot of investments with my wife into my company uh, for our, our structure, our overhead, our benefits package. Um, and all of these investments directly relate to um, our people, which I believe are our number one priority. Um, a lot of companies say that, but they don't practice it. I believe we've come out of the gate ahead of the curve practicing what we preach. Um, 
my accountant said not to do certain things uh, when I was setting up my our benefits. Uh, I went against that advice and did it. It cost me more. Um, it it took more time and energy, but. Now that's there, and our employees feel that um, their reward system is much higher than um, what a startup should be. Um, and I think we're out of the, that startup classification. I've invested in substantial training for some of my people that they couldn't even get at multi billion dollar organizations. I've spent that money on investing into my people because um, I really like that quote I saw, uh, and I, I, I don't know who it was, but it went along the lines of, um, um, uh, we should invest in our people. Uh, if you invest in our people and they leave, um, then they'll be able to go do better. But if you invest in them, they're going to want to stay too. So uh, I do believe in that. I believe in investing in the people because if they do leave, then they're equipped to go out and, and conquer the world. But you're going to treat them so well that they're not going to want to leave you. So it's a, it's a mutual win. Um, so the big idea is, uh, is, is really to do what I just said, build a company that's built on uh, trust and strong relationships. Now, tell us about Prospire. How long has it been in existence? Uh, we incorporated in April of uh, 15, uh, so about 16 or 17 months now. And um, we have uh, eight clients. We're up to 13 people. Um, and uh, we're delivering uh, a lot in the healthcare space. Uh, a lot in healthcare Pittsburgh, uh, but we do have clients uh, up and down the eastern seaboard. Uh, we're going to be opening up an office in Miami here in the fall. Uh, to uh, we we have some significant opportunities down in Miami, and uh, and we continue to grow and scale uh, reasonably and responsibly. Uh, so we we're conscious not to. Um, uh, expand irresponsibly, which the only people that pay for a ir irresponsible expansion of a company are the the, the employees, the people, uh, and the and the clients, because uh, their value, uh, the quality diminishes, and we don't want to do that. The No BS Marketing Podcast with Dave Mastovich is brought to you by Mass Solutions. Put our three-step No BS process to work for you. Visit MassSolutions.biz today to take your marketing to another level. It's all about bold solutions, no BS. How did you come up with the name Prospire? <laughs> Prospire came from uh, when we were when we were writing the vision statement. Um, and the vision statement's a, a little different today. Uh, not the meaning behind it, but just the words. But um, we're looking for a a, a, a one-word name. And and in the vision was well, we want to prosper together with our clients. Uh, we want our clients to hire us to prosper. And throwing around tons of different names, and that kind of just clicked. I said to my wife, "Hey, what do you think of Prospire? Like a like a play on Prosper?" Um, and uh, she liked it. And then uh, three other three the three other partners that uh, I was going to go into business with liked it, and um, sounded good. And uh, and then we get out into the marketplace, and nobody can pronounce it correctly. So it's kind of funny. Uh, but um, but that's okay. I'm starting to build brand equity uh, with the name Prospire. Um, got a cool logo, and um, hey, you know, companies need refreshes. Maybe it, maybe there's a rebranding strategy in my future in the next year or two. But uh, gee, I, I wonder who you'll talk to for that. I wonder who I'll talk to. Uh, but you asked me earlier. You know, you said Chris, when when were you vulnerable? That's a vulnerability for me right now. And I'm I'm okay with confronting that. Uh, my name Prospire is hard to pronounce, just like my last name. You've been impressed with me being able to pronounce it correctly. Oh, you're a Serbian. I can I can tell. <laughs> exactly. Um, Watching the USA in the Olympics play Serbia in the gold medal game, I was laughing with my kids because they would go, "How do you pronounce that name?" And I'd say Milosevic or whatever. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's uh, yeah. You're you're uh, you'll find that uh, the people out in the out in the world. Well, I, my name's not terribly complex, but I butcher other people's names too. So I, uh, I can't, I can't judge. I rarely judge, but, uh, but yeah. So talk to me about, tie it back to the hit the bullseye 
that I talked about with Lego That's and how right. Lego d- did some serious marketing intel. As we call it marketing intel because a lot of people have the word research. And you and I have had a number of conversations and the two words that I think have a big misperception are consulting and the word research and also the word strategy. All three of those words, for whatever reason, bug people. If you say you're going to come in and do some strategy with them or if you say you're going to do some consulting or do some research... If you talk to 100 people on all three of those words, there'll probably be 100 different perceptions of what that is, and that creates a problem. So we have learned that when people think of research, it could be all kinds of research. So we've narrowed it down to what we call marketing intel, because you're finding the intel about your company and your competitors. And what Lego did was they spent four years observing moms and girls with the toy and asking them their opinions. Talk about that, because you have told me stories about how you do some things like that on the B2B basis. Yeah, you know... um I think you and I do a lot of similar, our companies do a lot of similar things. I think in the market research space, um, you do, you do it a lot better and, uh, a lot with a lot more, uh, methodology. Uh, what Prospire has done is more on the systems usability interaction, uh, research. And we've done that very well. Uh, not to, it's, I want to say maybe apples and oranges. Yes. If you will. Um, we both execute very, very highly high quality. Um, but I think they carry the same themes and that is really getting into the customers, whether it's B2B, B2C, their thoughts, feelings, and expectations. Call it what you want. Consulting, assessment, whatever, all those, all those fancy terms Legos did, uh, and, 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 and you throw out there. The, the end of the day, what customer research is, is getting in their mind and getting to what are they thinking, feeling, and expecting? What is the journey that they're going through? Yep. And once you nail that down, it is so easy to understand how they relate to the process or the technology. And being the, being the consultant that we are, the ability to observe that, quantify it, qualify it, document it, and present back to whoever the seller is on what it is they're thinking, feeling, or expecting, and how it's not meeting that or making them feel, and the recommendations to close those gaps, that's the methodology that we live and breathe. And that's how, that's how Prospire does with, um, some of our large, uh, you know, Fortune 50 companies. Uh, we've done these assessments for, um, they love them because they get that insight that they're, they're too, um, you almost become too blind to your customer because you believe you know what they want. If you can get over that hump, you're able to see what they, not what they want, what they're thinking, feeling, needing, and expecting. You often talked and you told the one story because proprietary information, you weren't going to get into specifics. So this was just an example. You were saying, if we had this client and you were talking about how you said, what do I use for my financial stuff? And I said, QuickBooks. And you said, okay, if we were, if your company Prospire was retained by QuickBooks, what you and your team would actually do is go with someone that uses QuickBooks, say Monica from Mass Solutions would be on QuickBooks and you would watch her and just elaborate on that because that to me helps illustrate to the audience what you're talking about. Oh, yeah. So we would work with Intuit to identify, we would first of all sub- segment the customer. So um, let's just use a, use this example and use it uh, very, very high level um, framework. First, we'd segment the customer. So there's probably in, in QuickBooks analogy, there's probably small and medium business customer bases and startups. Then you'd look at different types of QuickBook users. Maybe there's consultants, maybe there's services, maybe there's products. You'd, you'd basically segment into personas. Um, then we'd work with Intuit to identify a few customers from each one of those segments or personas, and we'd obtain their permission to go reach out to them. Before we reach out to them, we'll go ahead and develop a few scripts, talking points, and then functional use cases for the um, the participants to to execute a few different functions. We'd let them. We'd let. We'd go meet with them. We'd schedule the interviews and let them know that um, there's no right or wrong answer. We just, the company into it cares very much about how you feel, want, think, um, what you're expecting. And we want to improve the product based on how you use the system. Um, we get the customer. Sometimes we can provide remuneration. Sometimes we can't. But um, 
we'll get the customer on board with this mission. And that's the other thing. You have to sell the customer that they're helping improve a product. And every human being wants to help each other. So if you're able to develop that relationship with the customers, which we've done so very much, so very well, and get them on board with helping the cus- the the business, the seller develop a better product, I think it makes for a much better quality outcome. And then you conduct the the interview and observation. You you ask questions about what they think or feel about the product. You have them do the 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 functional use case and, and go through the system and perform a few tasks. You look at their facial expressions, how they're interacting with the system. You look at their mouse clicks. You look at their mouse movements, and um, you sometimes they're going to say, oh, that worked great. Or sometimes they're going to freak out and use cuss words. And, um, and you have to stay objective, collect them, collect their thoughts. And then if you're able to quantify that and document it and give it back to the client, um, the, the seller, they're able to see what they were probably blinded to. So this is almost like a focus group, but in the field. That's Chris Militinovich of Prospire telling us how his company can work with B2B or even B2C companies to do what we at Mass Solutions call marketing intel. And he hits home really the key point is understanding your customer, segmenting your customer, understanding how they think and feel. Chris, pick a tool that will help our audience tell their story, craft their message, or communicate to internal and external target audiences. It could be a tool like Google Trends to generate content ideas. It could be your favorite blog or productivity resource whatever you think might help our listeners. I'll tell you what, Slack has been a, a have you heard of Slack? Mm-hmm. Slack has, I've become like an old man. I, I, you know, here's the best tool, staying away from the computer, getting out and talking and shaking people's hands and solving problems in real life. That's a good tool. But if I, I have a, um, I have a few projects where I'm developing some uh, mobile applications and uh, a few of my team members want to use this tool called Slack. Now, I right now have a have an open technology policy. Whatever you want to do that enhances your ability to deliver, um, go right ahead. So um, I said, all right, I'll give this Slack thing a try. It's really cool. It allows uh, instantaneous collaboration, file sharing, uh, communications, notifications. It's a really, really cool tool. I think they're valued right now at around a $4 billion company. I, I think they're looking at being acquired if they haven't been already. Um, but... Uh, you know, keep an open mind to, to tools and new tools. Um, that's one thing I've been learning is, you know, a lot of people will just say, no, I'm not, I'm not going to use Slack. It's, it's, uh, uh, at first I almost did say no. I'm like, I'm not using another thing. I don't need another thing. But that's then I, a common response we all do now. That's right. But I, I said, you know what, I'm going to have an open mind. They like this. Well, there must be something about it. Let me see. And now, um, now I can say I'm a user of Slack, and I actually am able to stay on top of some of these projects um, uh, from the directional level even better because I could see what everyone's kind of slacking about. Is that what you were doing while you were on the show? Because I noticed you looking at your phone. Um, I have to call you out for that. It's a little bit of BS, but we both did it. So was that what you were doing? That's uh, that's right, Dave. I uh, uh, it's tough to. Uh, run a company and do a radio show at the at the same time. I, trust me, I live it every <laughs> single episode. It's crazy. So you uh, you you feel Slack is a great tool for our listeners. I do, I do. I think that uh, I think not only is Slack a great tool, but uh, for the listeners, you know, don't don't. Um, don't have a closed mind. You know, there's a lot of great tools out there. There will be a new tool tomorrow. Um, keep an open mind. Uh, don't you know? Don't waste your time testing every tool, but find one that works and, and you're comfortable with, and, um, and go with it. That's Chris Miladinovich of Prospire. I'm Dave Mastovich, the host of the No BS Marketing Show. Chris. Messaging, leadership, and communication is what this show is all about, and it's really guest-focused, and you've told us a lot about your messaging, your leadership, and your communication, and you've talked about what's helped you with mentors and tools. Talk about the event and the messaging behind the event tied to NOLA, the mini pig. 
So, um, Nola the mini pig is our is our pet pig. We we live up in uh, Cranberry, and she is a famous pig. She snacks. She stands outside and snacks grass. Uh, she's on Facebook, Nola the mini pig. And um, a few years ago, uh, the Boys and Girls Club of uh, Western Pennsylvania reached out to uh, to Nola to through our Facebook and said. Uh, hey, hey, whoever the PR agent is for NOLA, we are, um, we, we'd like to host a, a new type of event, a gala, where we're going to invite, um, you know, the dignitaries of Pittsburgh and, and anyone that can come uh, aboard the Gateway Clipper, and we're going to have a Kiss a Pig event, and hopefully it's going to go well. <laughs> we're going to raise money for the club. Um, it's been a, a few tough years with the recession and donations for all charities. And uh, that club was trying to think of something new, unique, and different to get out in the market. I thought that was incredibly different. So, you know, Lauren and I, uh, we kind of, we talked about it for a while. Is this smart for NOLA? You know, do we want to, um, you know, pimp her out, if you will, <laughs> uh, you know, to, to raise and make money? Uh, how will she do aboard the boat? Um, how will she do around all the people? Uh, a lot of things went into consideration. Um, so we agreed to it. Uh, we agreed that, you know, if, if, if at any time Nola was uncomfortable or this wasn't good, that we would, we would back out. Um, and we wanted to make sure that all of the press was to raise awareness about the club or about having a miniature pig. Um, not about, you know, Chris or Lauren. It was about, it was about the club. Uh, so, uh, we agreed to, to do the event and, um, uh, it was a tremendous success. Uh, you know, that year, that first year, uh, they raised about $80,000. Um, and we thought that that was such a tremendous amount of money that, uh, we said, you know what? With Noah's expected life expectancy and and uh, this continued this continued trajectory, let's set a goal for one million dollars for uh, for the club uh, with Noah's help. Uh, so we've set that goal. And uh, this last year, this past year, we raised uh, Nola. The event with Nola's assistance raised about uh, eighty-five thousand. So she's she's well close to with with some of the other charities she does well close to about two hundred thousand in um, in in raising funds for a variety of charities. She does it for um, Crohn's and Colitis Foundation, uh, a few animal rescue uh, uh, farm sanctuaries around the area. Um, Boys and Girls Club. Uh, she does a lot of great work. She's a very charitable pig. <laughs> and you told the story in episode one about how you originally went to get a pig because you and Lauren, your wife, are both allergic to That's right. cats. And then you found out that she's allergic to pigs. So you went and got a mini pig, which you've stuck with it. What is the life expectancy of a mini pig? So um, my wife thinks that Nola's going to live forever, uh, but uh, they research says anywhere from twelve to twenty years. We've seen we've seen some of them. We're part of a group on Facebook. We've seen some go at twelve or fifteen. We've seen some go across the Rainbow Bridge at uh, you know at twenty or twenty two years. Uh, Nola's a very healthy animal. Uh, she's on a you know very healthy diet. She gets her exercise. Um, so how did they create it? to be a mini pig though it was through breeding uh through genetic breeding uh it was from uh this this trend started in england they brought you know they brought these pigs over these mini julianas over in the 80s they were a um they were a trend for a while kind of died off but now they're picking back up again um you know and while we're on this note you know if, if, if any of the listeners are thinking about getting a pig you know do your research um they are a different type of animal they require a different amount of work a lot of uh, homeowners associations do not allow them a lot of townships have ordinances against them um it is to me very frustrating make very terrible when somebody gets a pet and then rehomes that pet because they were the irresponsible one and didn't do the research or didn't have the commitment time. Um, make sure you're ready for that animal because they do have feelings. They do have emotions and they do get attached. And when you get a baby pig and you have it for six months and have to get rid of it because it's too much work for you or your ordinance doesn't allow it. Think about how that pig feels losing its new mom and dad. All kidding aside, do they, you know, you, you picture pigs on a farm and there's mud and so forth. And what, 
What's the mini pig? Where do they stay in the house and what do they, what's their maintenance? What's your maintenance with a baby pig? So they're very, uh, they're very routine animals uh, and there's a lot of misconceptions about pigs. Uh, some of them are that they're very dirty. Um, the reason they go out and roll outside in the mud, Dave, is because they can't sweat and that's the only way they can protect themselves from the sun. So if they're outside and it's sunny out, they don't want to get sunburnt, turn into bacon. They need to roll around in the mud and, and protect themselves and cool off. That's how they cool off. Um, they're very clean animals. They will not go to the bathroom where they eat. Um, Nola asks to go outside. She makes over 20 different noises. She communicates. She tells us when she's hungry. She tells us when she's tired. She tells us when she wants to snuggle on the couch. She she gets cranky. She gets she gets frustrated and um, uh, tired and, 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 and she gets things, she gets anxious when there's guests over or when there's something unfamiliar. She has all these different emotions. Um, she has very routine. She gets up at five, eats breakfast, takes a nap, goes outside, uh, comes back in, sleeps all day, uh, grazes outside a little bit, eats at five, goes to the bathroom at seven thirty, and tucks herself in at about eight o'clock every night and any dis deviation from that schedule she um she handles it with stride but uh causes her to sleep more the next day does she just graze in your normal grass yard or do you have to have something special yeah we have uh we we move her uh to we uh we call it zone one two and three front left and right side of our house so we'll rotate her and she'll she not only does she keep the yard um nice and trim but uh she also gives a little natural fertilization <laughs> to the yard on a daily basis which we clean up but um we do rotate her throughout our yard to keep the grass down the story of nola named after new orleans the mini pig and the tied to the messaging behind the Kiss the Pig event from the Boys and Girls Clubs of Western Pennsylvania. Chris, how can listeners contact you if they'd like to learn more about what you do? Yeah, they can contact us at uh, Prospire, 412-407-7337, or, or go to Prospire.com, P-R-O-S-P-H-I-R-E.com. Prosper at Prospire.com is also our email. Happy to talk to anyone about anything we talked about on the show today. Chris, thanks for being on the show. Thank you for having me. This was a fantastic opportunity. You're a great guy. For our listeners, thanks for joining us for the No BS Marketing Show. Visit MassSolutions.biz slash Bold Solutions for more information and to sign up for light reading where you can receive valuable strategies every other week to improve your marketing and transform your message. It really is light intended to be read in two minutes or less and just might trigger bright ideas for you. Again, to sign up, it's MassSolutions.biz. Remember, ask yourself, what's the big idea? and build your story around the answer. It's all about bold solutions.